Hi, I'm Chip Shearer, and uh, what I'd like to do today is give you an overview and an update of the Apollo Next Generation Sample Analysis uh, Initiative. That's ANCSA for short. And this is an initiative that is, that's goal is to look at unreleased, unopened samples that had been returned by the Apollo mission and kind of look at them in terms of looking back at Apollo and also looking forward to Artemis, uh, the next NASA program to return to the moon. Oops. There we go. Uh, I'm gonna talk about these, over, these themes in my overview uh, to some extent. Uh, I want to emphasize that my initial conception of the ANXIA initiative was to design it to function as a low cost sample return mission. And so members of the team and opening up these new samples really are very similar to a, a mission once the samples return. Uh, also part of the focus is really to go back uh, to some of the goals and the scientific questions of the Apollo program and utilize these relatively new, well, these new samples uh, to try to answer uh, and complete some of those science goals. Also, one of the rationale for uh, examining these new Apollo samples is to really place them within a context of 50 years of post-Apollo science. Uh, for example, there's, since Apollo, there has been numerous orbital missions that provide us with new insights on surface processes and allows us to, to place some of these new samples that we're looking at within a uh, better geological context and also to utilize these samples and analyze them using new analytical technologies. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, when I was introducing this, it really does provide a link between Apollo and Artemis generations of lunar explorers. And we do have uh, several Apollo astro well, astronauts and scientists involved in this ANXA team. Well, again, the focus of this is a focus on special samples collected by the Apollo program. In addition to just rock samples that were collected by astronauts, there were a variety of other types of samples. Uh, for example, in the upper left-hand corner, there was a tool that essentially had fine material at the very, at the bottom of it, when this tool was placed just barely on the surface of the moon and it collected just the first several uh, microns of material on the lunar surface. Uh, in the middle upper part is a rakes tool that was utilized in many of the missions to collect walnut sized samples in the regolith. There were samples on the far right uh, illustrating Boulder II uh, that's at the base of the South Massif. There are samples collected in shaded regions. Uh, there were materials collected, what referred to as a double drive tube. And one of the bottom middle images show one of the astronauts pounding in this drive tube to essentially collect the core uh, of the lunar regolith. Uh, next to that on the right is a, a drill core that was used or drill that was used during Apollo 17 to produce the Apollo 17 deep drill core. And in many cases, or in some cases, these special samples were placed into special containers. This is a, the, one of them on the far right bottom uh, in which these special containers were sealed on the surface of the moon and returned to earth. Hey Chip. Yes. I, I remember um, quite a, quite a while ago that we found an old report that, that summarized the, some of the details on the okay. on these special samples. Is that report 
Yeah, that was let, kind let of a cool. Let, let, let me answer the questions at the end. Okay, sure. Else, else I'll never get through the talk. Uh, how did this start? Uh, when I was chair of CAPTEM, and there's me in my browner days uh, on the upper left-hand corner. Uh, when I was chair of CAPTEM, Gary Lofgren, the curator at that time, introduced me to all of these special samples that Apollo had collected, but nobody had examined. So I took it on myself, and this was in 2009, uh, to prom promote a large science team to open and examine these samples. And as the years went by, uh, you know, I looked at these samples longingly, curation, uh, lunar curators changed. And so the bottom left is me talking to Ryan Ziegler probably in 2014, 2015, in terms of what a novel idea it would be to go ahead and re-examine these samples. And this promotion went from giving talks at national meetings to actually going to NASA headquarters, maybe once or twice a year to again, promote this initiative. However, 10 years later, uh, the associate administrator for the science mission directorate, and I think 2018, happened to visit the curation facility at JSC saw these samples and immediately decided, oops, this would make a great program. And so, he, so unbeknownst to my efforts, uh, he initiated this program. So, you know, all this hard work I had done maybe had set uh, something in motion, but it really was somebody else who really got it going. Uh, for the angst initiative, there are three types of samples that were that are being examined. And uh, the UNM group is actually only examining two of these. Uh, we're examining some of the unopened vacuum sealed Apollo samples. There were three of nine of these left. Uh, there was what's called a special environmental uh, sample container, a core sample vacuum container, uh, and those are the kind of the ones that, one of the ones that we're examining for this initiative. The upper left-hand diagram just illustrates uh, the difference between the CSVC and the SESC in terms of size. And they all function in the same way in terms of sealing. They have an indium knife edge and an indium seal. And once the core or sample is put in there, it's pressed down and there's a clamp that holds it in place. There were only two core sample vacuum container utilized during Apollo, one during Apollo 16 and one during Apollo 17. And we're opening the one from Apollo 17, 73001, which was the bottom part of a double drive tube. In the middle set of images that you're seeing there, uh, that is an image in the upper portion of one of the double drive tubes. And it consists of two parts, a lower and upper. And in seven, at, at, at station three, uh, we collected a pair, 73001, which was the lower part, 73002, which was the upper part of this drive tube. And 73002 is also part of this initiative. And it represents a unopened, unsealed drive tube. And that was the first sample we are essentially looking at. And then finally, there's another large group of, of scientists involved in the ANCS initiative that are looking at frozen Apollo samples that were essentially placed in the freezer 50 years ago, and now they are just being re-examined under cold curation uh, conditions. As I had mentioned, we, my initial concept was to organize this as a team. And, uh, and so we're essentially running this as a team. There are nine research consortia that were initially selected by, by NASA 
and we've combined these nine consortia into one team. And there are a variety of other members of each of these individual teams, but most of them essentially are linked to the University of New Mexico team, CAUSE, which is the Center for Advanced Apollo Analysis, Apollo's Advanced Center for Advanced Analysis of Apollo Samples. In addition to the nine teams, there are numerous teams from a variety of universities in the US and abroad, uh, a variety of NASA centers, international space agencies, ESA, who is attached to the UNM team, a variety of national labs like Lawrence Livermore National Labs and a variety of research centers. As being organized as a sample return analysis team, uh, Francis McCubbin, who is the head curator at the Johnson Space Center and I are ANCSA team leads. The interaction among team members, team science teams and data and sample sharing are guided by rules of the road document, which Francis and I put together uh, before we organized the team. There is a preliminary examination team to look at these samples that involves both the Johnson Space Center curation and the ANCSA science team. And there are over 60 scientists, engineers, and curators. I think it's pushing 70 now and 20 to 25 early career people involved in the science engineering and the preliminary examination team. Let me go ahead and give you some background with regards to the samples that we selected. Again, as I mentioned, the core sample that we're looking at uh, is, it is referred to uh, as 73001, 73002. And this refers to the seven refers to, it's the Apollo 17 mission. And the three refers to that this is, was collected at station three. On um, the image to your right is again, a image of the Taurus Littrow Valley uh, taken by the LROC, uh, L LROC camera on the LRO mission. The drill core, a double drive tube core was collected where the star is and it's located on this light mantle deposit. Uh, you can see it's lighter than the, the rest of the surrounding uh, base of the Taurus Littrow Valley. And it's about 50 meters east of the rim of Laura Crater, which I'll point out in another image. Uh, and I think this was called Laura Crater because I think at this time, Dr. Zhivago was, uh, a big deal, both the book and the movie. And Laura was the main character uh, in this book, one of the main characters. Uh, this light mantle deposit turns out to be a landslide material that came off the South Massif. Uh, and, uh, and so this core essentially penetrates this landslide deposit. 73001, which again, remember is the base uh, the lower half of this core uh, and the one placed in the core sample vacuum container penetrated a depth of approximately 70 centimeters into this landslide deposit. 73002 uh, was a core that represented the upper portion of the double drive tube. And at the base of the core, uh, the temperature was approximately 250 degrees K at the time of collection. Uh, in addition, what I've shown here is several of the frozen location points, collection points of several of the frozen samples that this uh, uh, team will be utilizing. The next little film clip I'm going to show you is essentially uh, Jack Schmidt and Gene Cernan uh, collecting this drive tube at station three. Uh, this is kind of looking off toward the North Massif, which you can see in the background, and the sculptured hills. And again, this is on this landslide deposit. And there, there are 
uh, communications on this tape loop, on this loop. But again, it's, uh, I'd rather talk over them right now. And as you'll see, you can see Gene Cernan pounding in this double drive tube. This is how the drive tube is collected. And he's talking with the science back room, NASA headquarters, and also communicating with Jack Schmidt, who will show up at any time now. And so Gene is running over to the rover to get additional tools. But again, that's how the drive tube was essentially in place to end to, uh, to collect the core. Now I'm just speeding ahead a little bit. And again, you're seeing the shadow of, of Gene and he's attempting to now pull up this core. And again, the upper part of the core will be remain in the core double drive tube. The lower part will remain in the drive tube, but then capped and placed within the core sample vacuum container. Uh, the next slide I'm going to show you here, it just illustrates at least some of the Apollo uh, science questions that we're, we're re-examining. The uh, lower crater is illustrated in the lower part of this diagram, this image, and the Lee Lincoln scarp is this snake-like feature that cuts across the Taurus Litzrosa Valley and moves up into some of the surrounding highlands. Uh, and what I'm going to do is show you a, a video flyover of this site. And this is from images put together by the LRO mission. There is a landslide deposit, the base of the South Massif, Laura Crater. And now we are moving across along the Lee Lincoln Scarp. And part of the one of the science goals for putting in this double drive tube was searching for indigenous gases coming off the Lee Lincoln scarp and trapped within the landslide deposit. And so we're essentially re-examining this sample that uh, the goal was to look at volatiles. Uh, additional science goals that we're continuing to look at are the preservation of volatiles from sh shadowed areas adjacent to boulders uh, which is part of these frozen sample suite of samples. So the question is, you know, is this the right time? And actually it's probably a little bit later than I wanted to, uh, but it's close to the right time. And some of the rationale for this is it's the right time because it really allows us to place these samples into a much more modern geological context provided by recent lunar missions. For example, in that those three images uh, shown to the left, uh, the upper left image is a topographic map uh, produced from uh, the Apollo 17 mission that was utilized to place these samples in a geological context. The slide to its right and below it are really great images from the LRO mission that provided, again, fantastic images to place these in the geological context. And then the D image is some data from the designer tool uh, that was part of the LRO mission that allows us to peer more deeply into the landslide deposit. Uh, and looking at the distribution of boulders and small rock fragments, uh, again, using this, this tool. So again, it's the right time. We have all these missions that allow us to re-examine the geological context. <clears throat> also during examination of the Apollo samples, we're using new tools that, uh, to look at these new samples. The image that's just to the left 
is a medical x-ray image of the 73002 double drive tube, again, peering through the core, the drive tube walls. And this is uh, the best image that we were able to get. And it shows some structure within that drive tube. However, one can use x-ray computed tomography to peer in deeper. And this is just the next is a movie that is essentially made from the uh, x-ray computed tomography images. Again, providing us with much greater resolution, allows us to dissect this core and provides us with insights. So when we do extract this core and try to dissect it, we know what we're going to find there. Also, there are a number of scientific rationale for utilizing these sorts of uh, images. Also, this is the right time because there are new and improved instruments and new analytical systems. For example, and, and Carl uh, will appreciate this, is that there are a number of members of this team who are going to look at chromium redox state in some of the lunar glasses uh, using this large beam line. Uh, there are a number of isotopic systems of volatile elements that 50 years ago, even 20 or 15 years ago, were not appreciated or could be measured. We're doing it with these samples. So what are some of the uh, science that we can accomplish with this? And this just gives some science that we can pull out. Uh, some of these are in proposals that people submitted. Some of them were general ideas that, uh, that I had. Uh, first, these are very unique samples that were sealed on the moon, never examined, and they're being processed in unique ways. And therefore, one can perhaps better understand lunar volatiles. Uh, also, space weathering and regolith processes, as these surface of these samples uh, have not been examined before and may be in a much more pristine state than previous uh, or current samples that you can, you can request from uh, the Johnson Space Center. It allows us to examine dynamics of surface processes on the moon, for example, and the lower bottom, lower left bottom are two landslide deposits. This is a common uh, surface feature on the moon. And this, this putting this core through this type of deposit allows us to define processes, triggers, and chronologies of the lunar landslide deposit. And there are a number of groups who are going, who are looking at the organic cycle on the moon uh, in terms of what are the organics in their sources that occur on the moon. And then they are also examining organic contamination issues that uh, can be a problem with lunar samples and also allows us to address contamination issues for other sample return missions. And then also we are examining differences between the upper unsealed sample from seven three from the from the double drill core collected at, at station three, and the uh, the sealed drill core, the lower part, which is in one of these core sample vacuum containers. That let that kind of last science agenda item that I have here also feeds well into looking forward to, a pol to Artemis uh, in terms of asking the question, how well do the core sample vacuum container preserve samples? And then what sort of tool improvements can be made for Artemis that allow us to better collect samples, preserve samples, and really produce uh, tools that are easier to use on the surface of the moon. And then finally, again, this sort of concept in terms of collecting and preserving samples and preserving uh, volatile rich samples feeds forward not only to Artemis, but perhaps to other sample return missions. 
Also, there's a techno technology linkage between Apollo and Artemis with Anxa sitting right in the middle. And, I'll, and several examples are illustrated here. But the one that I'll really point out is uh, being able to extract any gases coming off the core sample vacuum container. Uh, during Apollo, again, they only produced two of these and they are only used during Apollo 16 and Apollo 17. And again, one of these uh, are shown in the upper middle diagram. But what they didn't have is they never developed a tool or a protocol for opening these up. And so one, we don't know if they worked. And two, even if they worked, we didn't have a means of opening them. And so this ANGS initiative uh, is in the process and getting fairly close to building a system that will penetrate the bottom, the thinner bottom wall of the core sample vacuum container, collect the sample and extract it into a manifold. And so Washington University St. Louis right now is building a manifold and you can see to the diagram to your far right in the upper portion, uh, which will allow us to sample the gas and place them into containers that they can then be analyzed uh, in other labs. And also ESA right now uh, in a NASA ESA cooperative venture is producing a core sample vacuum container piercing system which will be linked to this manifold. Uh, the tar target date for utilization of this system is uh, the late summer of 2021. And this will open the sample and then we'll extrude the core as I'll show you in the next few slides. Also, we've developed a number of other uh, systems and tools to use. Uh, for example, the group at the University of uh, Virginia is developing a transfer vessel that will allow uh, material be, to be placed in this vessel within the, uh, the nitrogen uh, glove box, transferred to their lab to conduct XPS analyses, and then transfer the sample without seeing the Earth's atmosphere at all from this transfer vessel directly into the instrument. Now, this could also potentially be used for TEM studies. Uh, also, we've developed or we're in the process of developing uh, cold curation at again, minus 20 to minus 30 degrees, uh, multi-spectral analysis tool for again, examining the, the whole core. Uh, and finally, we're also developing techniques for reducing and monitoring organic contamination, which again, feeds forward to future missions uh, to Mars, for example, or even to Artemis. Now, the last core, Apollo core that was opened was in the early 1990s. And so the group, the curation group that currently has the at the Johnson Space Center, had no experience at all processing that core. And so essentially what we were involved in in the earliest stages is practice, 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 practice. Uh, we took a, a double drive tube that wasn't used on the surface, loaded up with a uh, lunar sample simulant and practiced it in a glove box with tools that had been used uh, in the 20th century to extrude this core. In addition to practicing, we are practicing preparing uh, for extruding this core. And we did this core in the, uh, the lunar lab and within a uh, experimental glove box and the tools uh, were placed in that glove box and the interior of the glove box was cleaned 
uh, and the individual tools, all again made of the stainless steel, were also cleaned. Prior to extruding the core, and again, this illustrates the uh, medical x-ray image of the core on the bottom, a slice through the core using XTC uh, analyses. We actually did XTC analyses of these core at the University of Texas, Austin. And these were transported by the curation staff within, contained, uh, con within containers uh, and produced these as the first step prior to extruding and processing the core. And the next several just images illustrate uh, processing this core. There are three uh, processors. Uh, the upper one shown here is Uliana Gross, who's on loan from Rutgers to uh, the Johnson Space Center. And loading up the core uh, essentially was a day long exercise. We did that on a Monday and it took the whole day. And then extruding the core from the double drive tube, again, took all of Tuesday. And so this was a two day process. And this is the curators again, processing the core. Uh, the middle two images illustrate the core after it was extruded. Uh, the upper right shows the relief on the uh, processors' faces. Uh, they put in two really hard days. And then I took them out for uh, wine and beer uh, on Tuesday evening. Following the extrusion, the outer rind of the core was plucked off. You can see that in the upper corner. This is the part of the core that was in contact with the, uh, the surface of the, of the double drive tube barrel. We did some imaging using um, micro uh, spectral imaging of a tool produced at the University of Hawaii by, by uh, Paul Lucy. And then during the dissection, we had our preliminary examination team come in and a variety of people, they went on one week cycles, although I think it'd probably be better to put people on two to three week cycles as this core was dissected. And then again, this shows uh, past one of the core being dissected. And during the dissection of past one, and in past two, the core was, was, was essentially sampled in uh, 0.5 centimeter segments. Each segment was sieved uh, and to separate the material that was greater than uh, one millimeter from though that material that was less than one millimeter and the uh, the greater than one millimeter uh, fragments are illustrated from one pass on that, uh, that insert on the upper right hand part of your image. Again, what we did, and again, this was available during Apollo. We used uh, XCT measurements to look at individual lithic fragments within the soil. Some of them that are illustrated here. And then again, this provides a non-destructive way of looking at these individual fragments to decide what the individual fragments are and build individual science plans uh, in terms of investigating what, the, what a detailed investigation of each of these fragments. So let me go ahead and go through again some of the science that I that we've accomplished or will be accomplishing uh, in the near future. Uh, this first chart just shows you some ANCSA firsts. This is the first opening of a specially collected core sample uh, from the moon. So there was Apollo 16 that had 
one core sample vacuum container collected in Apollo 17. 17, 73001. This is the first one that's ever, ever been opened. This is also the first examination of a core that, pen that penetrates a landslide deposit. There were samples collected on the surface of this Taurus Littrow Valley landslide deposit. But this was really, uh, this is the only core that actually penetrated that deposit, which will allow us to better understand the dynamics of lunar landslide deposits, the timing of them, and what triggers them. Currently, the two models for the uh, origin of the, the trigger for the landslide deposit, or actually there are more than one deposits, is one is a, a moderately sized impactor somewhere near uh, the uh, Taurus Littrow Valley may have triggered this landslide deposit, or this landslide deposit could have been triggered by movement along the Lee Lincoln Scarp. I think examining this will allow us to better answer that question. Uh, it's also the completion of really the first experiment and the only experiment uh, to sample indigenous gases released from the moon's interior. And again, this, these are gases that may have come out from, uh, may have been derived from the Lee Lincoln scarf. And again, we'll be able to uh, better answer some of these questions uh, once this sample is, uh, the gases from the sample are uh, uh, removed. Uh, again, this is the first Apollo core open since the early 90s. And it really is the first core examined by using uh, and integrating uh, Apollo, well-documented Apollo approaches, which were highly successful and in integrating them with new uh, types of technologies. And then finally, uh, in terms of ANCSA first, this is the first examination of Apollo uh, samples frozen for almost 50 years. What I'd like to do is again, go through at least uh, some of our preliminary results uh, and give you at least some idea where these results may potentially lead. Uh, this list, uh, some of the uh, ongoing science or science reported at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there's a lot, there are some that I didn't include in this list because I just filled up the page. And what I'm going to just do quickly is just touch on uh, three or four of these studies. One, stratigraphy and process uh, uh, properties of the core, uh, new lunar sample types that may be coming off the South Massif, uh, stable isotope analyses of the double drive tube material to get a better understanding of how volatiles behave uh, in the lunar regolith, and then uh, further processing of XCT data. Uh, there are numerous uh, measurements currently being made on the 73002 core. That's again, the core that wasn't sealed, but remained uh, unopened and just recently extruded. Uh, one of our students, Mike Okato, is looking at each individual frag, each individual uh, sieve grain size uh, and looking at those sieve grain sizes for mineral, the differences in mineralogy and differences in their various components making up each individual small fragment of the regolith. What this will do is when this is combined with uh, chemistry down core, this will provide us with a better understanding of the stratigraphy of the core. Uh, this and uh, examining the core 73001, will provide a full stratigraphy uh, of this drive tube, 
which will allow us again to address uh, drive to our land, lunar landslide dynamics. Uh, and Newman uh, and others at the Washington, at the University of Washington, St. Louis, just reported a variety of uh, major element and trace element analyses uh, within each of these 0.5 centimeter uh, segments of the core. Uh, we were also doing a wide range of other analyses, for example, looking at things like uh, percentage of agglutinates and other maturity indices such as magnetic properties. Uh, Steve Simon, who's in the audience, uh, has reported a variety of rock types from the South Massif that are in the uh, uh, the drill core, some of the samples we've examined. And this is also combined with some work that Brad Jolliffe is currently doing. Again, he's at Washington University, St. Louis. And again, the scientific rationale for looking at these is that you know the Apollo astronauts could not get to the top of the South Massif or uh, up the South Massif. So landslide deposits, really do produce a variety of samples uh, from this uh, somewhat dangerous terrain to uh, explore. Uh, a wide range of individuals are analyzing uh, different stable isotopic systems, for example, oxygen, chlorine, sulfur, hydrogen, potassium, copper, zinc, rubidium, iron, lead, and all of these uh, isotopes or these volatile elements behave differently. And so the hope is that looking at a variety of these stable isotope systems will provide us with a wide range of perspectives in terms of how volatile elements behave on the moon and behave in the lunar regolith. Let me just give you a couple examples. Uh, one, if one looks at uh, the, the, the sulfur isotopic system uh, and looks at a sulfur 34, 32 uh, and, and looks at that in terms of this, fact, this factor up on the Y factor, which is a measurement of the intensity of uh, magnetism, magnetism of these rocks. And it's related to how mature the soil is there is a positive correlation. As the soil becomes more mature, the sulfur isotopes uh, become more enriched in the heavy sulfur. Uh, the chlorine isotopes that we've measured thus far do not show that sort of relationship. Uh, some of our initial uh, hydrogen isotope measurements, that's in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, we are, again, examining these somewhat differently in terms of looking at these in terms of uh, different releases of hydrogen over various temperature ranges. And also, these are preserved uh, from terrestrial uh, hydrogen interaction. Uh, a variety of oxygen isotopes. Initially, one could think, well, this could be somewhat boring. And bulk rock uh, could potentially, uh, as could be predicted, that uh, it's similar to the bulk moon, as one would predict. However, Michael Cato removed some of the agglutinates, which are products of micrometeorite impact. And uh, Karen Ziegler did oxygen isotope analyses of these. And the, these values are different from anything ever analyzed on the moon thus far. And what this is due to, whether it's vaporization or incorporation of isotopically like micrometeorites, we don't know. And again, on the far left, far, far bottom right, are some of those people involved in these types of measurements. Finally, the next to the last slide that I wanted to show is that one can do so much more uh, with the XCT data than just Y section. Uh, to the two slides or two images to the left-hand slide, 
side of the slide. This is some work being done at the University of Notre Dame in which they utilize XCT measurements of a variety of basalts within this landslide deposit to deduce cooling histories of basalt, basaltic melts uh, that these are representative of. Also the group, our group at the City University of London are utilizing the XCT analyses and essentially examining each individual slice through here, through this whole core to reconstruct the stratigraphy and to utilize that stratigraphy to model lunar landslide deposits. And they've just started uh, the examination of the XCT data. And they just also just started the modeling of lunar landslide deposits. So in conclusion, you know, the goal of ANSA, one of the goals was to link generations of Apollo explorers from, uh, of lunar explorers from Apollo to Artemis. And, you know, all of us of a later generation uh, really salute these first lunar explorers. And, you know, we really are standing on the shoulders of giants. Thank you.